Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Well, I don't have to tell you that relationships are challenging. They can be. But even more challenging when there is a certain level of trust or not and being vulnerable in a relationship. And I'm not just talking about the close relationships, the romantic relationships. There's trust and vulnerability in business relationships as well. We're going to look at all of that today and how you can navigate more easily through it with somebody who helps people on the life coaching level all the time with this. His name is Mike Corral, and he's back with us. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Hey, Steve, how are you? It's good to see you again. You too, you too. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm loving that we're talking about this because let's start with trust. So important when it comes to a relationship. And I didn't think of it until you started talking about it before we got on here, that trust is pretty much everything. When you're, when you're dealing with somebody, you have your people at work, you trust there's different levels of trust. You have your personal relationships, different levels of trust. Um, your thoughts on that. I'm intrigued. You know, uh, I, I have been a victim of uh, either too much trusting in the wrong people at the wrong time or um, wondering why people don't trust me the way I want to be trusted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in analyzing all of that, you come to find out that I'm better off when people don't trust me, per se. If they trust the fact that I'm human, that gives me a bit of a break because what they're really trusting is my goodwill, my good intentions, and any benevolence that is, you know, inherent in, in who I am as a person, as opposed to me, the person who makes mistakes and who can forget things and, you know, make myself vulnerable in that way. So I prefer for people not to, you know, trust me, but in, in the goodness that they see, you know, because that's going to be all that's always going to be. You know, if I'm a good person, I'm going to be I'm a, I'm a good person that that may make mistakes. <laughs> so well, yeah. that's that's your morals, that's your integrity. Right. And uh, yeah. I, I'll, yeah. I'll 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 be very transparent here in that I am piloted by these words and I'm not sure if Shakespeare said them. I see Bob Marley is it's attributed to him as well, but it's pretty simple. It's love everyone trust few do the right thing. I might be paraphrasing a little bit there, but that's the essential part of it. And like you, I would trust everybody. And then it went wrong. Uh, and it doesn't mean you can't love everybody or send a positive love vibration. You could go to Starbucks and the clerk behind the counter, you could send, you know, you love them for making a great cup of coffee. You know, it's a different type of love, but you're sending it out there in that positivity. You you trust few though, but you always do the right thing. And when I say do the right thing, I mean for the greatest good, because we can say, wow, yeah, I, I did the right thing for yourself. Right. <laughs> Technically, I did the right thing. I did the right thing. Yeah. But that, <laughs> how did it affect others? So for the greater good. Um, but how do you navigate the whole trust thing? How do you, uh, yeah, I guess it boundaries. How does that all go? Well, you know, trust Trust comes from demonstrating a consistent level of trustworthiness. And we do that with the things that uh, we involve ourselves with, the communities that we involve with ourselves with, um, the behaviors that we engage in, uh, the causes that we defend. And, you know, the, the thing about all of that is once we begin to make decisions any decision worth making is going to have somewhat of a polarizing effect. So we, we can't please all of the people all of the time, but we, we, uh, we do need to know who we're pleasing and why, you know, the, the Bible says, woe unto you and all men speak well of you. And it's because you're not you're you're being a man pleaser and you're only showing superficial um, levels of yourself and who you represent. Whereas if you were to be um, moving out, moving forward with integrity as you're a whole and complete person, people are going to see you for everything that you are. And they're going to make decisions based on that. Yes, I, I believe in what you, you stand for or not. 
So we have to be okay with the portion of people that do not want to support who we are and with good reason. Hmm. When you feel that they don't want to support you, where do you go from that point? You have to uh, consistently evaluate your decisions and who you are. In other words, take another look at your integrity. Is your Are you in integrity, number one? Or are you failing in yourself? Are you failing yourself to some degree by not living up to who you say you are? Hmm. When we're okay, when we feel whole and complete, when we know that we're doing the quote unquote right thing, uh, when we know that we are in integrity, it doesn't matter who who doesn't approve. It's just a matter of time before people get a clearer understanding of what you represent. And from there, they can make a decision to reevaluate and make a new decision. Yeah, I, I, now I know who he is. Now I agree. So what I'm getting from you, it, it's it's a product of I am who I am and I'm going to stay true to who I am. And I guess that's, that's, that's key being authentic and, and, and not, not pivoting because you think people want you to, because you want them to trust you. Just, this is what I am. That's the way it's going to be. And if they change their view later in life, then that's great. You know, assuming it's, it's a positive view. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it kind of sounds that way. Just be your authentic self. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You know, and, and I'm going to be I'm going to be transparent with you, too, because just recently I was uh, talking with my therapist about my life decisions. You know, here I am in the, the later stages of life and I am st I still feel like I have um, grown and have lots of room to grow. Um, and so. In, in my life journey, I, I came to the realization that I lived a good portion of my life trying to please other people and, and getting into trouble for, for that. Uh, mm. A lot of it had to do with my fear of rejection, my fear of being alone, my fear of, you know, being an outcast for whatever reason. And, but in doing so, I didn't I didn't actually give myself a chance to develop into a person of integrity. I spent decades of my life just being whoever I thought I was supposed to be or whoever I thought would make me the most uh, acceptable as a human being. I, I want to look at that for just one moment. What you just said there, a person of integrity. I got to believe that you were a person of integrity all along. But but maybe it didn't resonate with you and you felt that you had to maybe overcompensate uh, and be a people pleaser, which many of us are, uh, and do a lot of other things just because of your your past, your upbringing, which, you know, we talked about that before, how your childhood can sometimes uh, kind of dictate your future. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, for for some of us, the, the areas of life that we that we are not proud of for whatever reason um, tend to get hidden and they tend to be uh, like put under a rock in some some you know, shape or form. It's kind of like, if have you ever uncovered a plant that has been covered for a while? You pick up a rock and you see a plant underneath it that was trying to grow, but it's like white. Totally and got it. It, it. It's We do that to ourselves by not fully allowing ourselves to be who we are not letting our, our light so shine before men, you know. And by not doing that, we, we discredit the world because we don't give them a chance to see who we can become. But more importantly, we discredit ourselves because we don't, we don't give ourselves the opportunity to be uh, accepted for our true self. It's like wearing a veil all your life and you expect people to appreciate you, but yet you're not revealing who you are. Does it feel when that happens, does it feel almost if you're, you're wearing a mask? Yeah. And you know, underneath there's this desire to come out, to, to show the world, your talents, to show the world, your skills. And it could be because your little inner circle of people were not appreciative of the things that are you or you didn't want to appear as if you're, you know, not a part of the group that you grew up with. Mm. 
And so you just kind of keep those things uh, under wraps for a little while. And hey, based on that, I want to share um, it, this sparked in my head. There's a song by Billy Joel called A Stranger. Mm -hmm. And it starts, we all have a face that we hide away forever and we take them out and show ourselves when everyone has gone. Essentially, <laughs> we know who we are, but we don't show everybody else. That's right. And then there's this part here. Well, we all fall in love, but we disregard the danger. Though we share so many secrets, there are some we never tell. Were you so surprised that you never saw the stranger? Did you let your lover see the stranger in yourself? Um, I, I think that says a lot in terms of, you know, us being true uh, to ourselves and true to others. Um, yeah. It, and that basically what the, the song is, you will never quench the fire you'll give into your desire when the stranger comes along. So essentially, you know, when the stranger, you don't even know who the stranger is. It's that person you're trying to be, but you're mm -hmm. never going to feel fulfilled when you are the stranger, basically a stranger to yourself. You know, you're not being you. That's others, right. Others may not know it, but it doesn't yeah. feel right. Something doesn't feel right. Right. You know, when we were kids, uh, we used to make fun of each other, our siblings, our siblings, we used to have these little sibling things going on. Um, my brother was the guy who looked at himself in the mirror 15 times and every, every mirror he passed, he had to stop and look, do the, mm -hmm. you know, the Fonz thing. Uh, my sister was all about performing and she'd take the hairbrush and she'd be dancing in front of a mirror and pretending to be singing. And we would catch each other in our act and we would just put, lay into each other. Look at you. Who do you think you are? The Fonz? Oh, who do you think you are? are you, you know, Cindy Lauper or, or whatever. And we would we would shame each other, which is a terrible thing. Now, now, now that I think back, because what it does is it contributes to that shame, you know. Mm. And it's it's not really anything to be ashamed of, but we use it as a way of protecting ourselves and saying nobody's going to see this this desire of mine to, to, to be a singer or or to look good or to do whatever it is interesting and by the way i want to tell you move your camera down a little bit seems to have slipped a, a little I want to see more there we go fantastic it, it it almost seems that when we're kids we pretend to be something that we're not but that we secretly would want to be you know, yes. the singer, the performer, you know, uh, I, I can just kind of look in the mirror, for example, like, uh, you know, your brother would look in the mirror and just like, yeah, yeah, I look good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, deep inside, probably is saying that. I want, <laughs> same thing with your sister. If you could be a singer, you probably would be a singer. Um, when we you know, make fun of each other in doing that, we're not really doing it in a serious way. No, we're not. Of, you know, right. Because because we think that those people, whether they're friends or siblings, we think that they're just having fun. But deep down inside, that's really what they want to do. They're letting their aspirations, you know, be revealed to themselves. Right, right. It, it, they're, they're looking at what they aspire to be, to become, and allowing it to, to, to present itself so that we can decide, yeah, that's what I want. That's, that's what I want to become. And we, as teenagers, as kids... We are becoming whatever it is we're becoming. And that's a very important part of our lives. So either we get the affirmation from someone, an external force that will lead us into the direction that will help us do that, or we uh, bring criticism and, and add doubt to it and cause people to, to be shy. Mm. You know, interesting view I'm getting from all of this and and I, I would have never thought of him until you brought it up, Mike. But it's as if as kids, we're teenagers, we're testing the water yeah. by doing it in front of other people, because then it becomes a reality whereby it may have been just a dream. And I'm thinking back, I'm getting, you know, visuals of my life little when I was little that I wanted to draw as a cartoonist and I would even copy cartoons and see what everybody thought. Like, even as a kid, like I'm five, oh, what do you think of that? And then I would go and draw my own stuff and I was just waiting for feedback to see if it's okay to, to go yeah. to the next level. And same thing with radio. 
I would record myself on a cassette uh, recorder. And then I wouldn't let anybody hear it, but every once in a while, I let them hear a little bit of it, you know, and then, and then, then it would grow. It got to the point where I taught myself electronics, built a mixer and then made up tapes. I'd actually would steal my sister's turntable because I needed two. <laughs> and I got my first job at 17 when I was interning at a cable station and the general manager worked part-time at a radio station. He took the tape out. He would hear some of the stuff and thought it was so good. He took the tape out and submitted it. And that's how I got a job. Wow. Because I had zero confidence, uh, got bullied for being the fat kid and all of that, lots of other stuff. I didn't have the confidence to, to say, I'm going to apply for a job at 17. Back then, and radio is still big now, but back then, I mean, I was, I got a job at the top station in the 12th largest market in the country. Oh and and the, and at 17 and that's amazing and, and that was a that was an am station then six months later i got a job at the behemoth big station and i was there for 26 years but you know what you're saying there i would toss it out to people you know just to see what they think you know because i have no confidence and i think a lot of us don't like your sister singing in front of the, the mirror and right. siblings are around she's testing the waters i think do you do you feel that we do that as well, even as adults, you know, we want that, we want feedback, we want affirmation, we want, you know, is it good? Is it bad? No matter what it is, no matter what it is. We do it as adults, but we're more careful as adults to choose an audience. Mm. You know, we, we choose an audience that we think is maybe going to be more affirming, you know, until we feel brave enough to actually be challenged and, and, and ask for critical feedback. You know, I studied improv as a, a young man. And after I was married and, and had kids, I studied improv in L.A. And improv, I'll tell you, in L.A., the criticism is just, it's awful, relentless. And it's not a place for shy people. You go there because you want to build character. You go there because you want to challenge yourself. You go there because you want to use the feedback. You want to try the feedback. Many different aspects of it until you decide on your own, well, this feedback works. That feedback, okay, it just doesn't work for me. When you become your own person and you become your best critic, uh, the external criticism, you know, isn't, isn't dangerous for you. It's not as harmful as it could be, you know, for someone who hasn't done that. Yeah, I, I, I wish I did improv, take classes. And uh, real short, a friend of mine is a great singer, uh, plays guitar, does gigs around town, things like that. He took it, took a class, and he said it was one of the most amazing um, <laughs> situations ever. Uh, I And he's a funny guy. I wish he would use that more when he's singing. Like he'd just walk up to somebody and kind of play with them a little bit and then walk up to skit. And, and it's all about reading people as well. I want him, before we run out of time, vulnerability. Trust and vulnerability is what we're talking about today in relationships. The vulnerability side, um, how do you become vulnerable to improve your relationships? You know, you pick a part of yourself that you're very confident with and you allow people to see it for its benefits, hmm. for its dangers, for its, for its limitations as well. But knowing that you're going to be safe despite their criticism, knowing that you're going to be safe uh, however it affects them. Because at that point, you want to make sure that your vulnerability doesn't trample somebody else's space. It doesn't create a sense of, of insecurity for them. And so, yeah, we, we do it with caution. You know, we do it with caution in the beginning, choosing our audience, like I said, but at the same time, being sure that our, our audience is still susceptible. They're just as vulnerable as we are. Do you think that we choose the audience and the part that we want them to see that we're, we feel good with because deep down inside we're saying to ourselves, I know it's pretty good. Like I'm not, I would never, I would never, um, I've never done improv. So I don't think I would test that people right away. Other stuff I would, because inside I know yeah, it's pretty good, you know, yeah. and we, we all, 
minimize ourselves. You know, we're all superstars in many different areas, are, you know, in our, all of our talents, but we're afraid to sometimes fully admit it. But we're careful when we test it out as adults, we pick those things and the audience, knowing that the results are going to probably be decent, you know, like in who you pick. Right, right. You know, when we when I was studying hypnosis, we had to do these clinics and we had to do several presentations of stage hypnosis. And one of the keys for choosing somebody to come up stage is by assessing which are the ones that are most eager to do what you, the things that you're saying before you, you choose them. And you're making eye contact with those people. Once you have made an internal assessment of oh, that, that person's going to be good to come up. That one's going to be good. Then you say, I need volunteers. And all of the ones that you had pre-assessed as, you know, <laughs> you pick them and they go up and they just perform. Yep. They're the ones who wanted to do it anyway. Yep. But yeah. it looks like, oh, they picked me. I didn't want to go up. They picked me. Yeah. yeah. It's like you, you pick your audience. It's the same thing as if you're, you're trying a new hobby or whatever it is. You're probably not going to pick your your best friend and you know if you're a guy you're probably not going to pick your best friend joe you, you might pick your spouse first because you know she's going to be nicer to you, you know? right, right. <laughs> and, and you're going to you know you're going to be careful about what you show um in the beginning stages of asking again i'm just picking a hypothetical thing like a hobby um sure. vulnerability in romantic relationships yeah. How do you peel the layers back and expose more, but feel comfortable in doing it? That was very tough because you, you know, you, you have to start with what you like about the person and what you, what you feel they need. Sometimes you can go with what you think they need more confidence in. Like if somebody's that's constantly hiding their eyes or hiding, their, you say you have the most beautiful smile. There's something about your eyes that just doesn't let me pull my eyes away from you. And you begin to build it, the confidence in them, because right after you've done that for them, the cue is for them to do the same thing for you. And that's going to be the time where you reveal something that you think they would appreciate. Mm -hmm. And you have this kind of like a, I don't want to call it a banter, but, but you have this give and take relationship with vulnerability. When you are vulnerable to somebody, they are going to be more vulnerable with you. Do it's you think it's possible? Aggressive. I'm sorry. Is, is it possible in a long-term relationship for vulnerabilities to be exposed? Let's say you've been married 15, 20 years, whatever it is. Yeah. Are there new vulnerabilities that may pop up? Yeah. Yeah. Well, because we're, we're growing people. We're dynamic human beings. We're always growing and changing. And we're making decisions about the, the ways that we want to grow and the ways that we want to change. And as we do that, we're becoming different. So there are new vulnerabilities in, in that case. What we do, generally speaking, is that we, we remember the things that we couldn't get away with or the things that we got negative feedback on, and we conceal those things. And we choose something that we know we would get praise for, and we re reveal those things. So, I mean, there is, there is some safe forms of vulnerability, and then... There are unsafe forms of, of, of you know, sure. vulnerability. Yeah, I guess in the long-term relationship, there should be new vulnerabilities even after 20 years, because to your point, and it's such an excellent one, you're growing. You're individually growing and growing together, but you should be growing individually. And if you're at the point where you're not exposing new stuff, even little things from time to time, you might have a problem. You might have some yeah. challenges there because it's... Uh, you know, it, it, the, the relationship could be, maybe that's the grounds for getting kind of stale. Yeah. And, you know, but one of the things to keep it fresh is that we allow each other to grow and we kind of make an assessment of the pace that each other grows. Some of us grow at a faster pace. Sure. We can't grow at the exact same pace, but to give you an example, and this is, you know, let's say you wanted to go out shopping and, and your spouse wants to change their style a little bit. They want to, you know, want to, they want a new fresh look. Well, you're going to go out and you, you're going to remember what they feel comfortable with, and you're going to compliment the things that inspire you. You're going to compliment the things that maybe they weren't that confident doing, wearing. You say, oh, that looks really good. Wow, that, wow what a great look that is on you. And, and you build their confidence because at the same time, 
you're providing the safety net for them to say, look, I'm going to go out on a limb and try a new style, new color or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, they'll do the same thing for you. It doesn't have to be with clothing yeah. per se. It could be different, yep. you know, something different. I guess it, 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 it also comes down to when you give that feedback, you have to be authentic. Cause yes. I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you can always spot a phony, <laughs> you know, you can, you yes. know, we can pick a special, especially it's a close relationship. Part of being kind is being authentic. You know, you can, you can give these shallow compliments to people and, and, and I mean, they're going to know, they're going to know you're just, you know, yeah. salesmen do it all the time. You know, you look fine. You look yeah. fine. You'll find like that's, yeah. that's a kiss of death. <laughs> yeah yeah you look fine uh, uh you know i like to test people and deliberately not look fine or do something that would you know that would right. require that negative feedback just was to that the, the was that the time you were wearing the later hosen huh uh, with with the with the philly shirt <laughs> was that oh, it? Yeah. I, I, no. I just remember that but, uh we're out of time I, I would love to continue talking and i i i appreciate your vulnerability in Thank in you. what you shared today because it, it's real and real relatable mike uh you work with people all the time on all different levels of this kind of stuff uh how do we find you how do we connect you can uh, reach me at optimallifepractices.com or call 508-648-0825 and uh, make an appointment i'll offer a free consultation just to get you going and we'll just take it from there awesome uh, as we said before, we shouldn't be strangers. Right. Shouldn't right. be. We need to be real and take the mask off. Uh, great talking with you. Appreciate it today. Likewise, Steve. You have a great one. You too. We'll be right back. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcasts on the go and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house. And there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit HFOTUSA.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's. It's going to be okay.